Well, good morning. We're going to read the Bible together now. And if you'd like one of the church Bibles, just put your hand up. Um, otherwise, we're opening up to Luke chapter 22. There are some people coming around with Bibles. So Luke chapter 22 is our first Bible reading starting at verse 7. And if you've already found that, you might want to just also flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because we're going to be reading from there as well. Then came the day of the unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now over to 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, and we're going to be reading from verse 23. One Corinthians, chapter 11, starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread... And drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being dis disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. Well, thank you, Susie. Church, good morning again. And uh, yeah, as we come to God's word and prepare to open that together, that'd be great to pray. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks. 
as that video before told us that you have uh, done all your work and you have to, uh, you provide for us through your word. And so we thank you, our speaking God, that you have communicated to us. Father, as we come to open your word now, we pray that you would reveal Christ to us clearly. And we pray that in hearts and minds we would be rejoicing in the good news of Jesus as we behold him clearly in your scriptures. And we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Communion. The Lord's Supper. Eucharist. What is it? Who is it for? Who is it not for? Is it for adults? Is it for children? Is it for believers? Is it for non-believers? Is it for Anglicans? Is it for Catholics? Is it for... Who's it for? Who is this meal for? What even do we mean by meal? Meal means different things in different contexts. Meal means uh, the four ingredients that you pull together in 15 minutes that those who are there to eat, eat, or those who are there later, heat up in the microwave. There's not really any rules for that meal. It's just sort yourself out. Meals are things that we eat at tables with family, and you definitely cannot have your elbows on the table, and you definitely cannot speak with your mouth full of food. Meals are also things that we eat on the couch in front of the TV, and therefore no one can speak because you need to be able to hear the TV. There are some rules for such meals. Meal might mean a sandwich that you eat while you scroll through your phone on the train, which is perfectly fine. But if your public transport choice runs on bitumen instead of tracks, then you cannot eat a meal, for you cannot eat on the bus. There are very strict rules, according to some uh, strict rules according to some meals. So, what are the rules when it comes to this particular meal, this meal of communion, the Lord's Supper? Perhaps you wonder if there needs to be any rules. Isn't it just a matter of putting in some glutinous or gluten-free bread into your mouth and having some grape juice? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal, 1 Corinthians 11.27 says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. All of a sudden, the stakes just got raised. So who should take communion and how should we take it? We will have communion later in our service. Should you participate? It's a good question. That's the kind of question that we've been asking in our series, Thick Religion. We're thinking about these religious practices that we have been given to shape our lives according to the story of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've thought about confessions and baptism and creeds. And today we hit communion. Who should take it? Well, to help us answer that question, we've got three points. And just because I can, each one of my three points has a subtitle for today, which is bad news for the note takers because there's more for you to scribble down. But the good news is they'll all be on the screen. So you can scribble it down when we get to that point. Three points. It's a meal that spans the ages. Point two, there's a bit that we all get wrong. Point three, it's all about the body of Christ. So let's start by thinking about this meal that spans the ages. And the subtitle for that, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Those are part of our liturgy. They are words that we hear when we take communion together. And they're very helpful words. They are simply relaying to us what Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 22. Uh, you can find it in Matthew and Mark as well, but we come to Luke 22. And Jesus says in verse 19, uh, it was in verse 19, it says that Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it instituting the breaking of bread and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so the breaking of bread is something that Jesus' disciples would do in the days and months to come and years and centuries to come in obedience to Jesus' commands. But when they did that, they weren't just remembering that Jesus died. They were doing more than that. They were remembering the full gospel story that Jesus brought to them. Because when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and communion, he gives them a context for the meal, a bigger story within which it sits. 
Uh, sometimes you'll sit down to eat at a restaurant and there'll be a little bit of an introduction to the restaurant on the menu or there'll be you know, a personal invite from the chef or something that sort of gives you a context for the meal that you're about to eat. Uh, there was, um, you know, sometimes that's, you know, the particular uh, combination of f- foods and cuisines that the chef has fusioned together. Uh, or sometimes it's because the owner has liked to put his own particular stamp on the menu in some way. Uh, they tend to be the restaurants that Gordon Ramsay ends up visiting. Uh, and I was visiting such a restaurant a number of years ago. And I want to relate to you some of the things that I read on the menu. Uh, bear in mind, as you hear these words, uh, this was a small enough establishment that it's almost definitely the owner, Tony, who writes them. So this is on the menu as we sat down to eat. Sit on our deck in our romantic hideaway, at the bar with the most extensive choice of drinks on the coast. So far, so good. Or around the dance floor and enjoy your meal while listening and dancing to the talented Tony. Listen as he sings through his vast repertoire of music which spans the eras from the 50s and through the decades right through to today's hits. You can see Tony weaving his musical genius on Fridays and Saturdays, but he can be persuaded to play for a special occasion. And I'm sure it doesn't take too much persuasion for Tony to come out for your meal. But that was the context that we were given as we sat down, so it wasn't going to be a surprise to us when Tony started weaving his musical genius in our faces as we ate. You'll be pleased to know that Jesus spans the eras in a more successful way than Tony does. Jesus spans the ears as we come to the Lord's Supper. Just before verse 19 in Luke 22, verses 15 and 16, we get these words, they'll be on the screen. Jesus says to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. See what Jesus does there. He takes Passover this meal that has been celebrated by God's people for thousands of years, and he links it to that night, the Thursday night before he'll be crucified, where he will become the Passover lamb. And he links this meal to something that we anticipate in the years to come. We anticipate Christ's return, where the kingdom of God is fulfilled. This meal that we have, communion, links past present and future together. It's a meal that spans the ages. It lifts our eyes above the here and now, the ins and outs of day in, day out life and says you are part of a story that governs eternity. That's what we participate in when we take communion. And so as Christians start celebrating communion, for it is a meal for Christians, Jesus gives this to his disciples to eat Christians communicate in this meal who Jesus is, that he died, that he rose, and what's more, he's coming back to reign over his kingdom. And so it's an evangelistic meal in that sense. It's a meal for Christians, but as outsiders look in, the meal communicates that there is something significant going on here. The Apostle Paul says, In our second reading from verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, same word as preach, you preach the Lord's death until he comes. This meal preaches that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And we see this evangelistic nature to communion going on in Acts chapter 2. Again, it'll be on the screens. The early Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And Luke, who wrote Luke's gospel, who talks about Jesus breaking bread and instituting this meal, is referring to communion as he talks about the breaking of bread from the early Christians, obeying Jesus' command. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And the impact of that, a few verses later, we see in verse 46, is this. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily 
those who were being saved. This early church community that broke bread together, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, saw people added to their number all the time. Because it's a meal that spans the ages and lifts our eyes above the day-to-day. And so it communicates the gospel to the world around us. So if you're here this morning and you've been wrestling perhaps for some time as to whether you're a Christian or not, whether you are going to go fully in on the I'm here for Jesus and I'm following him and his death covers my sin, it could be that today is the day that you decide, you know what, I do believe that. And when we take communion later, today might be the first day where you take communion as a believer. What a wonderful thing. There is nothing getting in the way of you doing that. Please come and join us. But before we get to that point in our service, there's a couple of other things for us to think about. Because there's a bit we all get wrong when it comes to communion. Point two for today. And, uh, and in this one, our, again, our liturgy is very, very helpful with us. Our subtitle, Feed on Him in Your Hearts by Faith with Thanksgiving. Again, things that we hear uh, when we take communion. Now, if you're new to church, it might seem strange to you that there are set words for particular things. It might feel a little bit formulaic. Uh, But I think we'll come to see that these words are really, really helpful for us and that they matter. Uh, We do associate different things with different words. If I were to ask you what the words hocus pocus refer to, if I were to ask you what that conjures up in your mind when you hear that phrase, uh, my guess is that you would say it's something like magic, sort of a made-up garble of phony words that fictional literature has picked up to associate with acts of magic. And that's pretty true. But it's got an interesting history, the phrase, hocus-pocus. It actually comes from the Roman Catholic Mass or communion service. The actual Latin is hoc est corpus meum, which means this is my body. And it's related to the moment in the Roman Catholic Mass when the priest will hold his hands over the bread and say those words, and the bread, according to a Roman Catholic doctrine called transubstantiation, changes its substance to become the body of Christ. And so it's almost like this magic where you you say the magic words and then there's a change. And so for Catholics, Christ's sacrifice on the cross is made present for them again in that moment. Now, for most who aren't Catholics, we hear that and dismiss it. I can't see that in the Bible anywhere. I think it's an example of the history and tradition of the church having too strong a influence on how we do things, and so we don't believe it. But it is something that we all get wrong, at least in the sense that we find it very hard to agree, Christians throughout the ages, as to what exactly is going on in that moment. And among the Protestant reformers 500 years ago, as they were reforming the church, you had different understandings of what was going on in that moment. So Martin Luther rejected the idea that the substance changed as the priests uh, spoke over the bread, but insisted that Christ was still physically present somehow in the Lord's Supper. Others said that Christ wasn't physically present, but he was spiritually present and is spiritually present as we take communion. Others say Christ is not present at all. It is purely a memorial, just something that we do remembering. So what is it? Hocus pocus, real physical presence, real spiritual presence, pure memorial? Well, if you're asking me, I don't think it can be purely memorial. Because if that were the case, 1 Corinthians 11 would make no sense at all. Verse 27, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat. Before they eat uh, of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. If it was simply a memorial, that doesn't make sense. Paul seems to be teaching that we are in a very real sense 
eating, feeding on Christ when we take communion. But that doesn't mean that it needs to be a physical presence. And in this instance, our liturgy is really helpful for us in articulating what I think is right, a real spiritual presence of Christ. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You see, we don't feed on Christ in our stomachs by our teeth. We feed on him in our hearts by faith. And as we do that, as we feed on Christ, he sustains us. He is our diet. He is our sustenance. And through the gospel, Christ satisfies our hearts. It's a real spiritual presence in communion. Andrew Wilson, an English pastor, says it like this. We actually participate in the body and blood of Christ. Consequently, if we do so in an unworthy way, we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. The logic of statements like this is that in the Lord's Supper, just as in baptism, Christ is presented to us, not just represented to us. I love this last bit. When we celebrate the sacraments, we do things that do things. And so if we do these things without care, or if we do them flippantly, well, watch out. Verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 11. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Now, in the context of 1 Corinthians, the problem is that there are divisions in the church, and especially in this moment along lines of, of wealth and material status. Uh, and so there you had uh, the wealthy people in the congregation who could knock off work early, and they would come to the gatherings uh, whenever they pleased, and they would start eating and drinking whenever they arrived. And then the poorer workers who had to work longer hours and couldn't get away until later, they would then rock up to the gathering later and there'd be no food left for them. They would go hungry, verse 21 tells us. And so Paul says, look, if you're about feeding your stomachs, eat at home. But wait until the whole church has gathered when it comes to feeding on Christ because this is an act of unity. And we feed on him together. He says, make sure you do it in the way Jesus told you to, verses 23 to 26, and examine yourselves to see if there is sin in your life which you haven't repented of. It's good to do. And it might be that we sit out of communion for that reason. But the context of 1 Corinthians points us even more uh, explicitly to examining ourselves to see if there are issues between us and other people in the body of Christ. If there's a, a brother or sister who we've had uh, a disagreement with and we, we, there's tension between us and we haven't resolved it, well, that ought to be resolved before you have communion together. Or if there's someone who you need to apologize to, maybe you need to sit out of communion until you have a chance to do that. Otherwise, we're pretending that the body of Christ is uni united and unified when actually there's division amongst us. And to borrow language from another part of the New Testament, when we do that, you are crucifying Christ all over again because we're breaking the body that Christ has brought together. Verse 29, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. We do things that do things. And Paul says that unworthily taking communion has led to the death of some members of the church. So when you take communion, you don't have to be somber. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be really down. But we are to be serious and engaged in the meal that we are taking part of. And then as we take the meal and we share it with the body of Christ, we can't help but have that seriousness turn to a serious thankfulness and an overflowing joy as we look at the body that Christ has brought together by his blood. This is our final point for today. It's all about the body of Christ. Uh, imagine that it's a warm summer's day and you are out for a bushwalk. It's a lovely day. You can hear the cicadas chirping. You feel the, the gentle humidity of the bush. It's not too hot, but it's warm. It's just one of those moments of tranquility. 
and you're walking along and you see a red belly black snake on the path three meters in front of you. Now, how does your body respond in that moment? Well, let me tell you what doesn't happen. Your eye doesn't say to itself, gee, I'm glad I'm a meter and a half off the ground so I don't have to worry about that thing. No, your eye sends a message to your, your feet that says, stop. And your feet stop stepping, your legs stop moving, your body freezes, and everything simultaneously sends a message up to the brain that says, hey, we've frozen, get us out of this situation. Because bodies instinctively work together. They play their role to ensure that the whole body is acting rightly. And if there are parts that aren't doing that, well, there's something wrong with that body. And so it is in the church when we come to communion and the body of Christ eats together. We're all involved, uh, which means there's a slight segue and there's room for disagreement on this point. But I think that's why children should be invited to take part in the Lord's Supper as early as parents feel like they're old enough to eat and drink. Because this is a, this is a meal for the whole body to take together, to learn what it is that Christ died for us, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. It's a meal for the church. And there's a posture, there's a way that we are to celebrate that together as the body. And our liturgy is helpful for us. It says, drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Thanksgiving and gratitude and joy ought to be the way that we are as a church family, having taken communion together. Uh, this is one of those moments where English is not that helpful for us, uh, English as a language, because when we speak in the second person, the singular is the same as the plural. If I'm speaking to one person, I address them as you. If I'm speaking to a crowd, I address you as you. It's the same word, so we've got to work out which one it is. But because we're so individual as a society and as a culture, when we hear the word you, we assume that it's just speaking to me. And so we hear those words that Christ died for me as an individual, so I should be thankful as an individual. Now, that's true, but that's not what's going on in communion. It's saying, drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you all as a church body. And so be thankful together as a church body. Christ has died for us, which is why we share a meal together to celebrate it. And that changes the way that our gatherings work. I love the vision for communion that we get in Jude. In verse 12 of Jude, there is a, uh, it's, it's talking about people who are an unhelpful presence in their gathering as they eat together. Uh, so you can ignore the, the context a bit, but just look for the word that is used to describe uh, the gathering together of God's people. Jude 12 it says, These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Now, that's not some fancy translation of the Bible. Right? That's not a fanciful thing. That's the NIV describing, this is what the Greek says. Love feasts is what we do when we come together to eat together. Apparently, that was the best description for the church as they gathered. So we should be thankful together in such a way that others look on and go, there's some serious love for one another going on in that place. And each member of the body is expressing that in their own way because that's what bodies do. When bodies are thankful, hands clap, emotions soar, mouths sing, legs dance, all of a body, all the different members express thankfulness. And so we ought to be thankful together as we share in communion because we're doing this meal, this meal that spans the ages this meal that shows us that the body of Christ was broken so that we who are many might become one body. Christ was broken that we might be whole. And so we prepare for the meal with a thankful seriousness, recognizing what we're doing. And as we have the meal and afterwards, there's a serious thankfulness that overflows. So we're going to take communion now. And uh, as Carol's going to come up, I'm going to invite Pete up, who will oversee communion for us, and I'll invite the communion helpers to come forward at this point as well to distribute the bread and the juice. Uh, this is for anyone who loves Jesus, 
If today is the first time where that statement is true for you, you are so welcome to join us. And if that's the case, uh, we'd love for you to tell us, actually, so we can help you take the next steps uh, in that decision. But this is for anyone who loves Jesus. Secondly, if you're not a believer, let the bread and juice pass you by with no shame or judgment. It's a serious thing that we're doing together as a church family. And thirdly, hold on to the bread and the juice so we can eat it together, because this is a meal that we share together. And as this is coming around, you might like to prepare for this meal with a thankful seriousness, a discerning the body of Christ as we get ready for the serious thankfulness that we experience as we have this together. Brothers and sisters of Norwest,
with serious joy and serious thankfulness and perhaps a new understanding of the words that we say. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you that such a small thing can point to such a magnificent reality. Father, we thank you that We sit here, forgiven people, because your son's body was broken, because your son's blood was spilled, that our brokenness would be dealt with, that our blood would not be required to pay for our sin. And Father, we do it as one. We do it as your people. We do it as your household. Father, you help us grow in our love for Jesus and more and more each day. And in his name we pray. Amen.